are listening to Mobile Payments Today podcast. One newsletter brings you the world of money. The World of Money newsletter is a skimmable daily summary of payments and financial technology news from around the globe, covering trends and technologies in banking, fintech, transactions, blockchain, security, mobile, and more. Sign up now at worldofmoney.com. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode number 13 of the Mobile Payments Today podcast. I am your host and the editor of Mobile Payments Today, Will Hernandez. I'm smiling as I say that episode 13 thing because we are in October and I didn't know there was a Halloween remake coming out. I saw that in a preview when I went to go see The Predator, which we're not going to talk about. (laughs) But I think it's appropriate that we're coming out with episode 13 just a couple of weeks from Halloween. Get that whole spooky vibe going on. Speaking of spooky, not really much going on news-wise. And I wanted to keep the intro short because... We do have a long Q&A this week, a very interesting Q&A with Zach Goldstein from Thanks, and I get into it with Zach about marketing and how that affects merchants and restaurants going forward. We talk a little bit about payments. We talk a little bit about AI. We talk a little bit about Amazon Go. So it's definitely a wide-ranging podcast episode, and I don't want to get too bogged into the weeds with an intro today but one thing i will say quickly was an interesting bit of news last week that i saw about how walmart's basically going to force um their rewards users to use uh walmart walmart pay going forward to make sure they get the savings from that savings catcher thing that i that they have and that's a really interesting development i think that could either work out one of two ways it seems obvious but it's going to be one or two things that happen people are going to rally against it or they're just going to resign themselves to using a walmart pay so it's interesting that they're using that tactic it makes me wonder just how successful walmart pay has been to the chain i don't know if they're just having trouble getting people to use it more they made this whole investment and they're not seeing the returns that they want. But combining the loyalty aspect of the savings catcher with Walmart pay, I think it's a good thing. I mean, I think the more people, the more you get people getting used to paying with a phone, I think that trickles down into other things. And, you know, there are going to be some people who don't find that to be so uh, the best way to do things in terms of consumers using a phone to pay for things. But if you're already accessing that savings catcher through your mobile phone, what's it going to hurt to go ahead and use Walmart Pay to complete your purchases? So a bit of pushing. There's, there's some pushing going on there with Walmart. And you kind of saw that with Starbucks, really, in a way. They came out with this great app to really track your loyalty. But it also turned out that you can use the app to pay to pay for your drinks at Starbucks. So that's the thing. When it comes to Starbucks, people don't really realize it's not really the mobile payments that drive Starbucks. It's it's the loyalty that drives Starbucks. It's the fact that I can track my rewards on that app, but I also can just happen to pay as well. So let's see if that same thing happens with Walmart Pay going forward. As I mentioned before, this week's Q&A, I talked to Zach Goldstein from Thanks. I also have Shelly Whitehead on board this week. She is an editor here at Networld Media Group. She's the editor for QSR Web and for Pizza Marketplace. And her and I get into a conversation about things that are going on in those areas in terms of marketing, digital ordering, and delivery. So stick around for those two interviews, and I'll be right back after this quick break. World of Money informs professionals in the financial sphere and end-user markets about trends, technologies, and ideas shaping the future of money and payments. Sign up for the free newsletter now at worldofmoney.com. And welcome back to the Mobile Payments Today podcast. 
I am here with my guest this week, and that is Zach Goldstein. He is the CEO and founder of Thanks. And Zach, thanks for joining us this week. How's everything going? Absolutely fantastic. Great to be with you. Thanks. I really appreciate that. And, you know, part of this conversation is going to be about loyalty and just the role that loyalty is playing these days. And particularly in general, brand loyalty is something that I know it's important to merchants of all kinds. And thanks just release a new product offering called Thanks Campaigns. And how, how is something like that that you're offering here helping merchants build and retain loyalty going forward? Yeah, I think the, the idea of loyal customers is, is quite clear uh, as an important driver of growth in a business. Uh, you know, you think about the 80-20 rule and how uh, so much revenue comes from a small portion of customers. Uh, and yet loyalty has long been associated with loyalty programs and rewards. That's missing the boat. Uh, that might be one step in the broader process of building deeper relationships with loyal customers, but it's about actually understanding customers personally and giving them that unique experience, even when they're not in your business, th that is actually making them know that you care. And so loyalty is, is sure, it's about rewarding customers, but it's also about personalizing your interactions with them, capturing feedback and engaging and responding uh, and talking to them uh, in a way that's relevant uh, and, and not just the generic message that a lot of brands are doing, whether it's via email or SMS. And so this launch of Thanks Campaigns for us uh, represented that step forward. It's about delivering a full uh, suite of tools to engage with customers personally uh, and this is the way other industries side of restaurants and retailers have been using marketing automation tools for a long time. Look at that data and start treating customers in different unique segments or one-to-one -one, as opposed to uh, screaming out blanket promotions to everyone that are all the same. You mentioned something really interesting there just about building that personalization and making that correct uh, that connection. Is that getting harder to do nowadays because – Consumers are being pulled in so many different directions from some from so many different brands. Is it hard to capture that attention more nowadays than uh, than ever before? That's right, Will. It's it's uh, it was possible ten years ago to send out emails and get very high open rates and believe that that was actually changing people's behavior. Uh, the data shows very clearly that it's not these days. Sending out the generic message to everyone. Uh, it doesn't get opened because Gmail and other tools are getting smarter at, at sorting those things out and knowing that you send the same message to 100,000 people. So it, it's probably not something the person cares very much about. And, and it's, it's also consumer behavior is, is becoming different. Uh, we often talk about the promiscuous customer, the customer that is spending their money in a lot of different places. What they want to change that behavior is someone who, a, a brand that demonstrates they care. Uh, and the way you do that, the same reason that, uh, you know, a restaurant server comes by and asks you, how is your dining experience? Uh, that's a personal touch. Well, the marketing that you do when that consumers outside the four walls of your business has to also be personal. But the burden there has always been, uh, that's a lot of data to analyze. That's a lot of extra work to, to engage with customers through a whole bunch of different segments personally. Uh, and so we've made it one click whether you're driving people to a slow time of day uh, or a slow day of week, whether you're promoting a new menu item or a new location, uh, or, or whether something else has changed, like uh, a customer that generally has a great experience had a bad one and you want to engage with them personally and understand what went wrong. All that needs to be as easy as the click of a button, and that's what Thanks Campaigns has enabled. You mentioned something about kind of the data and being able to analyze that data to come up with these targeted personalized uh, offers and sometimes those things don't always live up to their billing i mean we always hear stories and read stories about consumers that receive irrelevant offers that are supposed to be personalized and i'll give you an example i was at cvs been going to cvs for two or three years and we know they're what they're known for is those long receipts but i'm getting offers for makeup it's just like I've never purchased makeup, but yet that is coming up on my um, on my receipt. So my question to you is, as somebody who, who who's working in this area, why does this continue to be a problem in terms of the 
marketing not being exactly targeted the way you might want it to be? It's a great question. And, and what it comes down to is, is the incentives. Those long CVS receipts uh, are uh, by the brands, the toothpaste or the makeup brand, trying to uh, get their promotion out there. They're not about delivering great experiences to consumers. We've taken a different approach. We are focused on working with uh, merchants that want to build deeper connections with their customers. And that's their primary goal. And so when we optimize a campaign, it's about letting a consumer know, here's something that we truly believe you care about. Uh, and, and it's talking to the customers who matter most, the ones that already have a relationship. Again, we're not trying to find some random person off the street uh, and get them to come in and make a purchase. We recognize that all the best growing brands that we've seen already have great customers that, are, that like them. It's about locking in that loyalty by making sure that those people are recognized and rewarded for their repeat purchasing behavior. So I, I want to make sure here that we kind of talk about mobile payments a little bit, considering this is a mobile payments uh, uh, a, a podcast. And I, I know a lot of the times loyalty and mobile payments kind of get mixed together. And there used to be this argument that uh, proximity based mobile payments with loyalty, that can be a big thing. You you mentioned Starbucks. They've obviously done that with, with their loyalty program. But in general, it's kind of been a struggle with the Apple Pays and Samsung Pays of the world. Uh, do you think, you know, as an observer there, do you think anything needs to change there uh, right now just in terms of that argument with linking loyalty and, and mobile payments together? Yeah, I, I, at the end of the day, uh, I, I think that what we need to see uh, for mobile payments to really take off is is ubiquity and uh, and ease of use and and honestly we're not quite there in most cases people are willing to change their behavior with Starbucks because it's a daily activity and so it, it becomes routine and yet the majority of the places that you go uh, it's way simpler just to follow the thing you've already been trained to do for 20 years which is pull out your credit card pay and leave. Uh, and so that, that ubiquity, that every place takes a mobile payment uh, and that it becomes the obvious thing to do, uh, that's what's going to be necessary for us to see that inflection point. Now, in, in your question about linking it to loyalty, uh, I mean, one of the things that we've seen very clearly uh, in the data is most loyalty programs, think of those traditional plastic card programs, uh, have a really high breakage. For every 100 people that sign up originally, uh, only about 40 are still participating a year later. Uh, and so that's bad for consumers who were trying to get rewarded. It's bad for merchants who were trying to build better relationships with their customers. And it's because of that friction of carrying a card or typing in your phone number. Uh, it, it just slows things down. And so one of the, one of the magical things that happens with a thanks power loyalty program is that it's all tied to the payment itself. You make a purchase with any, with any payment card, you're automatically recognized, you're automatically earning rewards, you haven't had to do anything different. I think that's a big step forward in terms of real-time customer engagement in the store. And mobile payments is moving in that direction as we see uh, in many instances, paying with Apple Pay is now faster than waiting for the EMV chip to register. That's helping. That's absolutely helping. And as you see that trend continue and more places reach kind of the, the universal ubiquity of mobile payments, I think we're going to see that inflection point just as we're currently seeing it with the ease of use with loyalty. Does And this is something that comes up uh, at various conferences that I've been to, the, the need to have maybe sort of a, a mobile loyalty play. Is, is that something that you're hearing a lot about from, from merchants and, and restaurants, just in uh, retailers and restaurants in general, that they want something mobile based uh, with their loyalty programs? Yeah. I mean, uh, I'll tell you something that might come as a surprise coming out of my mouth because thanks, we build uh, mobile applications and branded mobile applications on behalf of uh, the merchants we work with. And we have, uh, we have a huge number of active users of those applications. And, and yet, uh, I don't believe that the mobile application is the long-term 
winning uh, venue for consumer engagement. I think you have to take a multi-channel approach. Right, right. I mean, we have, we have millions and millions of active mobile app users, and yet uh, I don't believe that's the only approach. I think you have to take a mobile, you have to take a multi-channel approach. You know, we, we just launched uh, a chat interface that you can activate uh, via SMS. And so you can communicate and earn loyalty rewards and, and receive personalized promotions uh, without downloading an app. Uh, and, and a lot more chat-based infrastructure is going to be in place. Uh, and despite the fact that, that email, for instance, uh, is, is not a good single customer engagement tool, it's an important arrow in your quiver. It's an important tool among others. And so we still see that for a, for a declining but still sizable category of consumers, email is an important tool as well. The point being you have to use multiple channels to talk to customers, and a mobile app uh, may be a really good one. It has particularly high response rates and very high engagement with push notifications. But it's a big ask if you're a small brand to, to have your consumer download your mobile app um, and every other mobile app for all the other places they go. Uh, and so it's not going to be the, the only strategy that works. You have to have a multi-channel approach. Yeah, I do like the idea of interacting with just a chat bot via SMS. And I, I've seen a couple of examples of that going forward. So uh, I'll be curious to see how that plays out. And maybe that's one of the trends coming up here in the loyalty space. Uh, one last question before I, I let you go. What are some of the things that we can we should be keeping an eye on here going forward, and especially maybe as they relate to, to payments and the payments industry when it comes to loyalty? Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll give you a couple. One, one is the one that you already highlighted. I think we're, we're, we're quickly finding that these big data technologies are actually approachable to smaller businesses that never thought that was possible. And so you highlighted some of them, but, but AI and machine learning and, and a tool we use, natural language processing to actually analyze all the customer feedback coming through and highlight some of the trends before a problem could have been identified actually in the store. Uh, those are really neat technologies that with the right partner, uh, even smaller businesses are, are able to take advantage of. Another trend we're seeing, the elimination of friction at the point of checkout. And I think the best place to see this is in convenience stores where Amazon Go and a whole host of other technologies are making it cashierless checkout. Walk in, grab some items, walk out with them, your card is automatically charged. Not only is this faster uh, and, and sometimes easier, uh, but there's one other thing that's really important to note. That makes the, the brand smarter about who's been in their store and enables them to do better merchandising, enables them to build deeper connections with customers the same way it works online. Uh, and so that's a, that's a both important trend and a major threat to legacy players who have historically been pretty blind to those types of things. Um, and then the last trend is, is another one that's maybe surprising. Uh, and despite all those things, I believe firmly brick and mortar is far from dead. And main, main street small businesses are far from dead. We're going to see that era. And, and I'll give you several important examples, but perhaps leading, leading example is that Amazon uh, is opening brick and mortar stores. Right. No one, no one ever thought they'd see that. Right. And so, you know, e-commerce e direct to consumer brands are opening up brick and mortar stores. And so real world commerce is far from dead, uh, but it's changing. And most importantly, in our mind at the forefront of that is you got to know who your customers are because of that 80, 20 rule, because a small number of customers drives the vast majority of your revenue. Focus on them. That's what's going to define winners and losers in brick and mortar businesses. All right, Zach. Well, listen, this has all been a very interesting conversation, and I definitely uh, thanks for joining us this week. And hopefully, we will uh, talk to you again down the road. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the time. And uh, for anyone that wants to learn more about Thanks Campaigns, it's thanks dot com t h a n x dot com. Uh, and and thanks very much, Will. I really enjoyed the conversation. Hey, everyone. And Payments Today podcast. 
I am here now f- with our weekly editor corner, and this week I have Shelly Whitehead. She is the editor of two publications here at NetWorld Media Group. That's QSR Web and Pizza Marketplace. And Shelly, how's everything going this week? Thanks for joining us. Everything's wonderful. How are you, Will? Very good, very good. Well, listen, you know, this is, you know, you work, cover a very interesting area just in terms of the food services, and it seems as though technology uh, plays a key role here, and it, it seems what technology is constantly changing, and that seems to affect uh, consumers' ordering habits when it comes, and expectations when it comes to the, in the, to the restaurant industry right now. So h- how do you think um, the technology right now is affecting what consumers are doing and how they're interacting with uh, with restaurants right now. Well, I tell you, well, restaurant customers are they're a super demanding bunch. They expect their favorite restaurants to be not only up to speed and equipped with the latest and the greatest when it comes to technology, but you know that's a difficult thing for a lot of restaurant tours because they operate on the very thinnest of margins, as a lot of people are aware. And even that's pushed by things like demands for higher wages and fresher food, and it all costs money. So I think for the the mega chains like the KFCs and the McDonald's of the world, staying tech current when it comes to mobile pay is is not as big a deal as it is for those that are kind of the up and comers and the smaller mom and pop stores which a few of them have told me it's a struggle, not only to kind of fork over the cash they need to stay up to date technologically, but really also to actually understand how all this very technical stuff works well enough to maximize it for their brands and use it to its most potential. Sure. And it seems you kind of mentioned it. Some of the bigger brands are probably better equipped to handle these things uh, than the smaller brands. But do you think in general that restaurants are doing a better job of addressing these issues when it comes to technology? I'm impressed. <laughs> but I, it doesn't take a lot to impress me. But uh, but they are doing it. Frankly, they are doing a wonderful job. And I think they're working their tails off to meet customers' demands and really doing a lot of continuing education like through our summits and the like. Because even if you have an IT person on staff who knows everything about how all this works, the brand's leadership really needs to know, know it too so they can maximize it. You know, I moderated a webinar this summer, Will, that was with Speedline, and they specialize in POS systems for pizza restaurateurs. And in that webinar, they really took kind of a nice step-by-step approach to show brands how to look at their online presence, both mobile, via PC, and all the venues that you can now go through to see if you're bouncing off customers when they're already pretty impatient because they're hungry and looking for a place to eat. It was really interesting to see some of their suggestions, little things that you don't think of, like do you need to pinch and zoom pictures a lot? So really that was that was fun and interesting to hear. Yeah, and definitely for our listeners right now, if they want to go ahead and go on either QSR Web and Pizza Marketplace, those webinars are always available to our readers. So Shelly, one last question here there's always this delivery aspect of, of the restaurant industry as well. And we're seeing restaurants either do their own thing or partnering with things like Postmates or Uber Eats and, and things like that. How do you think that aspect of, of it is going right now in terms of how restaurants are making sure that the food actually gets to the people who order it off premise? Well, I tell you what, delivery's where it's at in this business today at least, um, particularly in the QSR and pizza worlds that I occupy. And uh, there again, mobile presence for any brand is critical. So it's things like making sure you've invested in spectacular pictures online, that you um, really have an intuitive process for finding your menu and placing that order or reordering. Those are absolutely essential in this delivery process, which more and more restaurants are depending on a good chunk of their income 
uh, for these days. All right, Shelly. Well, listen, thanks for joining us this week. I, I really appreciate your time. Bye, That's going to do it for this episode of the Mobile Payments Today podcast. I want to thank Zach Goldstein from Thanks for coming on to the show this week and talking about what's going on with marketing and merchants and restaurants. And thanks again to Shelly Whitehead for joining us here for the first time. She's the editor of QSR Web and Pizza Marketplace for NetWorld Media Group. And I definitely enjoyed the conversation we had about what's going on in those industries right now. And a bit of bad news to share here, but by the time you listen to this podcast, I will have already moved on from mobile payments today. Covering this industry more in depth for the past five years and then covering payments in general for the past 11 years. And to think that I've been covering payments in general for 11 years is pretty, it's pretty amazing. A lot has changed. Listen, a lot has changed in 11 years. And some people don't want to admit it, but a lot of it can be traced back to that first iPhone. Obviously, Apple did not reinvent the smartphone per se, because if you look at places like Japan, they had more sophisticated phones than we did for a long time. But the fact that Apple was able to come in, kind of create that app marketplace, and look what happened. Look what happened when those apps started coming out. We got introduced to mobile banking. We got introduced to mobile re- deposit capture, uh, facial recognition, Touch ID, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Play, Venmo, PayPal One Touch, Visa Checkout, Masterpass, Uber, Amazon, Postmates, uh, Netflix, Spotify. The list goes on and on and on. And obviously, the other manufacturers have caught up and in some cases surpassed Apple in some ways. But again, look at look back at that first iPhone and all the things that came out of that first iPhone and the app marketplace and you'll see was that was really when payments I think changed a lot and mobile banking as well the banking industry changed as well and we see the banking industry today still having a problem catching up to those fintechs who have uh, used that smartphone environment to their full potential so that's the one thing I'll, I'll leave you with I'll definitely miss covering mobile payments in depth as much as I did here and it was a good ride So thanks again for following along the past five years. It's been quite the journey. I've seen a lot. I've been to a lot. I've been on a lot of conferences, panels, uh, hosted panels, moderated panels, been on podcasts, been quoted in mainstream publications, which I'm always going to find that weird. So I appreciate the people who are following me on Twitter, who are following me on Mobile Payments Today from the beginning. Those people came from other places where I was at before, and I definitely appreciate your loyalty. And thanks again to the crew in Louisville, to John Vincent, to Paige Hobbs, to Brittany Warren for helping to put this podcast together from the beginning until now. I appreciate all you guys' work, and you will definitely, I will definitely miss you guys going forward. And I think that's it. That's going to do it. Again, thanks for coming for the ride. Keep supporting the podcast. Follow me on Twitter going forward, and uh, I'll catch everybody down the road. Thank you.